Photosynthesis and cellular respiration are two extremely important concepts in biology. To put it simply, photosynthesis is a process that some organisms, like plants, use to create specific molecules that can be broken down as food or used for cellular infrastructure. Cellular respiration, on the other hand, is a process that creates cellular energy by breaking down those food molecules. When I say food molecules here, I am primarily talking about glucose, which is an extremely important and prevalent molecule in eukaryotic cells. And when I say cellular energy, I am referring mainly to ATP, because this is the preferred energy-carrying molecule that many cells use. You should notice that these two processes are the exact opposite of each other. Photosynthesis, as shown in the image with the chemical reaction moving to the right, uses carbon dioxide, water, and energy from sunlight to create glucose and oxygen. If we reverse this reaction and break down glucose in the presence of oxygen, we get ATP, which the cell can use as an energy source, along with water and carbon dioxide as byproducts. Keep this relationship in mind as we move through this video. Cellular respiration, now in a bit more detail, is really defined as the controlled release of energy from organic compounds to produce ATP. This is a multi-step process that occurs when both glucose and oxygen are present, which is also known as aerobic respiration, aerobic meaning in the presence of oxygen. Let's focus on a basic overview of this process and leave out the nitty-gritty details. The steps of cellular respiration happen in two places, in the cytoplasm of the cell and within the mitochondria. The first step is glycolysis, where a glucose molecule is broken down into two pyruvate molecules and two ATP molecules are produced. From here, the pyruvate molecules get altered with a link reaction to create a molecule called acetyl-CoA, which then enters the citric acid cycle, also called the Krebs cycle. A series of reactions take place within the Krebs cycle creating high energy carrying molecules like NADH and FADH2, along with a small amount of ATP. These high energy carrying molecules then enter the electron transport chain which, along with oxygen, create a large amount of ATP yielding around 32 per glucose molecule that comes in, bringing the total to around 36 ATP molecules. Once created, this ATP can be used to power cellular processes that maintain normal cell function and homeostasis. On the previous slide, we looked at the process of cellular respiration, which is a process that requires oxygen. The reality is that oxygen is not always readily available to all of the cells in your body, especially when you are expending a lot of energy and your mitochondria are working hard to replenish the supply. In this scenario, the available oxygen will get used up rather quickly, so much so that your breathing will not replenish the oxygen fast enough for your body to continue to make large amounts of ATP. When there is little oxygen present in the cell, it is still important that they create energy to maintain their functions. This is where the process of anaerobic cellular respiration comes into play, which allows the cells to create a small amount of ATP without oxygen present by using glucose. The process starts out the same where a glucose molecule is broken down into two pyruvate molecules. This produces our small amount of ATP. Instead of performing the link reaction, the pyruvate in animal cells is converted into lactic acid via the process of fermentation. This process creates energy carrying molecules that continue to support glycolysis, so the sugar can continue to be broken down and a small amount of ATP can be produced, which is much better than producing no ATP at all. As discussed on the previous slide, the cells within the human body, especially the mitochondria in our muscle cells, continue to produce ATP under anaerobic conditions. This scenario usually arises when we are hard at work doing physical activity or exercise. Our muscles use ATP to generate movement, which means the harder and faster we are moving, the more ATP gets used. While this is all happening, your body needs to make more ATP, and to do it efficiently, it needs more oxygen. This, in a very simplified way, explains why you start breathing faster when exercising. You literally need the oxygen to keep your muscles working efficiently. But increasing your breathing rate can only do so much, and our oxygen intake will eventually not match our needs. Under this circumstance, your muscle cells still need energy. So aerobic respiration will switch to anaerobic respiration, creating that small amount of ATP and lactate or lactic acid as a byproduct from glycolysis and other reactions. 
Interestingly, the high levels of lactate in your muscle cells causes fatigue and soreness, that pain that you feel when exercising that makes you want to stop. It's a sign that you need to rest and recoup the muscles into a state where they can use oxygen again to make more ATP and give them time to break down the lactate buildup to alleviate the soreness. Humans use anaerobic respiration capabilities of other organisms to do some pretty cool things. Organisms like yeast, which are single-celled fungi, undergo anaerobic respiration within bread dough, breaking down the sugars that are present to create carbon dioxide, which helps the bread rise and cook properly. While alcohol is also produced from the fermentation, it is boiled and evaporated away by the time the bread is done cooking. This just goes to show how humans have innovated on basic understandings of biological processes to create new things that would likely never occur in nature. Pretty cool. Now that we have covered cellular respiration, let's take some time to talk about photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is essentially the opposite of cellular respiration. Instead of breaking down glucose for cellular energy, photosynthesis creates glucose molecules that store energy. This process happens with the help of chlorophyll, very special molecules that exist within photosynthetic organisms. For this process to work, the organism needs chlorophyll, which are found within chloroplasts in plant cells, available water and carbon dioxide molecules, and energy from sunlight. The process starts with what we call the light-dependent reactions. Light comes into the plant and hits two important things, chlorophyll and water molecules. The water molecule gets split by the energy from sunlight into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen is given off as a byproduct, while the hydrogen is used in the process. The result of these reactions supports the creation of high energy carrying molecules like ATP and NADPH that move to the next phase. The next part of this process is called the light independent reactions because sunlight is no longer required for these steps to occur, though now we do need carbon dioxide. The high energy carrying molecules created from the light dependent reactions are used in the Calvin cycle to turn carbon dioxide into sugar. That's right, the carbon from carbon dioxide that the plant gets from the atmosphere are converted into stable sugar molecules. This process has many steps that we are going to skip in this video, so just know that it can get much more complicated, but the end result here is a complete glucose molecule. This glucose molecule can then be used by the plant for building and repairing cellular structures or can be broken down via the mitochondria in the plant to create ATP. And, hmm, what's that process called again? Oh yeah, that's cellular respiration, a process that the plant also undergoes along with photosynthesis. When talking about photosynthesis, we also need to talk about chlorophyll and the visible light spectrum. We know that the process of photosynthesis absorbs sunlight for energy, but what structure actually has this role of harnessing the light? The answer, chlorophyll. There are two main types of chlorophyll and each structure excels at absorbing a specific wavelength of light. White light coming from the sun carries all wavelengths in the visible spectrum, but the energy is broken up by these two molecules. Chlorophyll A does a great job of absorbing the red wavelength section of the visible light spectrum, where chlorophyll B can absorb more of the blue wavelengths. Interestingly, both chlorophyll A and B do not actively absorb the wavelengths found in green visible light, meaning those wavelengths get reflected away from the plant and are therefore not used in the process of photosynthesis. When we look at a plant, our eyes are receiving those reflected wavelengths, which our brain perceives as being green. It's kind of crazy when you think about it, a lot of our planet is green because that wavelength is not useful for plants and instead is reflected and perceived by any organism who has the ability to process that wavelength. While photosynthesis is a great process that supports most of the life on our planet, this process can be limited by many factors. We can start to make sense of these factors by treating the process just as a simple equation of inputs. There needs to be light for the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis to occur. So no light means the process is limited. Adding light to the system will cause an increase in photosynthesis, as we can see in this graph, but only to a certain point. If there is an overabundance of light, it does not necessarily result in an increased rate of photosynthesis 
because the plant has a limited number of chlorophyll. Additionally, carbon dioxide works within the same idea. If we have small amounts of CO2, the process will be limited. If we add CO2, it will result in an increase in the rate of photosynthesis, until the point where there is so much CO2 and not enough physical plant material in space for the rate to continue to increase. Temperature, on the other hand, works a bit differently. Taking a look at this graph, we can see that the rate of photosynthesis is highest around a middle temperature, meaning that if the environment gets too cold, the process will slow down, resulting in an overall decrease in photosynthesis. And if the environment gets too hot, structures within the plant will also not work properly, resulting again in a decrease in net photosynthesis output. There are other factors that can affect the process of photosynthesis, but knowing and understanding these three is a great place to start. It's crazy to think about, but there was a time many billions of years ago when photosynthesis did not exist on our planet. It is estimated that the first photosynthetic organisms existed around 3.4 billion years ago. And let's remember, photosynthesis is a process that produces oxygen that mainly goes into the hydrosphere and atmosphere. It wasn't until around 2.3 billion years ago that the Earth housed large populations of photosynthetic organisms, resulting in a large amount of oxygen being dumped into the atmosphere. This diffused oxygen has greatly shaped all aspects of life on our planet, eventually leading to larger organisms like humans that can use this built-up oxygen in the air to undergo cellular respiration. It is still debated as to which process came first, photosynthesis or cellular respiration. I'll leave that up for you to research and decide.